Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another rendition of the b and Virtual Event Space. I'm very happy to welcome back uh, a man who is basically a, like, a, like a piece of wonderfully aged furniture over here. Uh, Mr. Gabe Bitterman, what's going on, Gabe? How are you doing? <laughs> I'm finally chiseled. Is that what you're saying here? That, that, that's <laughs> it. You're, you're, you're chiseled and you're, and you're smooth and, you know, you've, you've got that nice soothness to you. So, you know, uh, Gabe, Gabe is a regular here. So if you haven't seen him, uh, this, is, this is obviously a treat for you. Uh, but he's going to be talking a little bit about night photography, uh, some things to do with being afraid of the dark, and 10 tips for gaining comfort and creativity with the night photography. So, you know, if you live in the city, like uh, some of us do, the, the dark's always kind of mysterious and nerve wracking. You know, you got to watch out what alleyway you go, go through and everything like that. But I think Gabe's going to talk a little bit more about maybe some of like the stuff like the bears and the, the, the creepy crawlies and things like that. Uh, for anybody joining us here on Zoom, YouTube, Facebook live stream, please feel free to get any questions you may have in. Go ahead on Zoom, use the Q&A panel, and then with all the rest, you can use the comment section. And we'll get them over to Gabe as we can. Uh, without any further ado, though, Gabe, the floor is all yours. Thanks for coming back. We appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you, Scott. And really, it's it's a it's a wonderful to be back here, especially part of this week is uh, b and celebration of night photography week. So I'm thrilled to be kicking it off and part of it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I've been as a stalwart at B&H for over 20 years, as well as for the last six years, I have been, I co-founded the night photography educational program called National Parks at Night. And, uh, and again, that's what we're going to, we're going to focus on. I have a brand new, pro, brand new presentation for you today. And I, I really want this, I'm going to definitely share, obviously, you know, some of my uh, fears, tips, and, 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 and things, but I also, I want this to be interactive folks. Uh, so please comment, please, you know, drop in your fears, your questions. And we're going to save some time at the end to kind of address that and have a conversation about it because bottom line, I don't care who you are and where you are. We all have fears, you know, some are physical, like, you know, I'm not a fan of spiders. Okay. Or some that are more internal. You know, and that really kind of weigh on our confidence. You know, but I hope that today we can be open and honest and that the and and with our fears and by at least acknowledging this, because sometimes we just internalize it so much that it makes it impossible to overcome. Right. And I started this uh, presentation. I was inspired to make this out of a presentation by my one of my uh, my co-founder also at National Parks at Night Matt Hill very good friend he gave a presentation at our night photo summit last February and it was called don't be afraid of the dark fostering a creative night photography habit now matt it was interesting matt's kind of take on it was his story about how he got over a photographic funk, you know, obviously during COVID, we were indoors a lot. Maybe we we're not getting outdoors and stuff like that. And he, and some of us like myself, we just start stop shooting for a month, two months, or even longer. And boy, those trigger fingers were getting awfully angry at us. And Matt did this project where he just went, he kind of felt that wall, the walls coming around him and that, you know, and he said, I got to get out. I just got to get out. And he started shooting every night and it was just you know documenting his neighborhood getting out there some nights were successes some nights were failures but he was putting himself out there and that gave him the confidence to do it again and over but in that presentation something very magical happened and that was i was monitoring the chat and the chat just exploded it exploded with people's fears Fears of shooting alone, fears of being a woman out at night, fears of being a man out at night. All these fears kind of came up about centered around night photography and what prevents us from doing something that we're intrigued with, interested in, or are passionate about. And I wanted to continue that conversation. So whether this is part two of Matt's, we can consider it, or just extending that conversation, um, I'm really excited, you know, to put this together. And it was originally titled 10 Tips. Um, and I, I just, I, when I started writing this a few weeks ago, it 
was well beyond 10 tips. So, uh, you know, buckle up, stay, you know, get, get seated, get comfortable. That's one of the tips here. And I'm excited to share this as well as some new work that has never aired before and has helped me get more excited to get out there and seize the night. So without further ado, let's shift over to sharing my screen. And let us go. Here we go, full screen. So here's the official new title, Afraid of the Dark, Tips for Gaining Comfort and Creativity with Night Photography. Um, this is a recent shot of me, a uh, shot of mine. I took this. Uh, in a cemetery. This is a very surreal cemetery. This is um, sort of like a, uh, a hospital cemetery. I had access to this. This is along Shenandoah during our Shenandoah workshop. And this was actually at a hotel we were staying at that was used to be a uh, prison as well as a mental hospital before that. Uh, it was a nice stay, I think. <laughs> but uh, we we shot, we spent a night shooting on the grounds, and I, I love cemeteries. I, I do. Um, there is obviously a natural <clears throat> concern, fear with cemeteries, but I love overcoming it. What, what I'll say about a lot of my fears is that fear is this emotion that is very close and can be similar to excitement, right? fear, excitement, they both get your blood pumping, your heart beating and all this stuff. So whenever I fear something, I try to mentally shift this over to excitement and try to conquer it, try to challenge it, try to push it. Um, and the, one of the first cemeteries I photographed at night was Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. And Sleepy Hollow Cemetery is one of the most fantastic historical cemeteries out there. And I'm shooting there with actually Matt and a couple other friends were scouting for what would be our first workshop there many moons ago. This is probably 10, 15 years ago. And I remember, you know, generally when I do night photography, I like to spread out. I don't like to bunch up. And I was like looking for my own visions. But, you know, I started walking around and I kind of separated myself from the pack and I got around a bunch of tombstones similar to these. Um, and it was, you know, I saw all of a sudden the ground was squishier. I just, you know, Walking Dead had just come out, you know, so I was thinking about zombies. And of course, once that opened that door, then I started thinking about all these other things. And I definitely could not photograph at all. And I could see 50 yards away from me, Matt, and the rest of the group kind of photographing. I'm like, you know what? I'm not comfortable. I'm going to go over there and shoot with these <laughs> with my friends. And that helped me gain more comfort just by being around and, and just kind of dispelling these fears that were coming in at me. Um, and we're totally irrational, right? Um, I don't know. Put in chat if you've seen a zombie before, but besides on TV, you know, so these were totally irrational fears that I were having, but they were fears nonetheless. Um, and I acknowledged them and I got myself out of that situation. Luckily it was easy for me to just kind of walk again, like 50 feet or so and kind of get to the comfort. And I told my, I told my friends, I said, I just, I don't know, it was, had this wave come over me. And um, we, we all kind of acknowledged that, you know, and, and said, well, let's stick together, let's shoot together. And that really is, is one of the, key, of the key things. And we're gonna to get to that, of that comfort of shooting together uh, with, with more people out in the field. So before we get really, really started, just wanted to obviously give a, uh, a little bit better intro uh, and how you can follow my, me and National Parks at Night. If you're not following us already, there's our website, nationalparksatnight.com. And these are the social channels that you can follow us on. All of them except Twitter are, as you would see it, National Parks at, at Night. Twitter, you know, we have to scrunch the, the letters a little bit. And my personal Instagram is runism. Uh, my uh, passion is in finding the sort of the beauty and decay. I love history. I love ruins, um, abandoned stuff. So, you know, I did more of that earlier, but I still love the history and I love doing it legally <laughs> more so than urban exploring as much um, just because I like kind of building that relationship if it can be found. So check out that um, on at ruinism.com. And, and, uh, and a note, you know, National Parks Tonight, if you're not following us, give us a follow 
we'll actually going to be announcing some of our next year's workshops quite soon. And you want to be on the mailing list because you'll hear first about it. All right, so first things, we have to understand our fears, right? And, and how do we how do we overcome it? It's this could be a very difficult thing, especially if it's in your in your in your head, and especially if you do not have a support system. But here's the bottom line, people: fear is normal. Each and every one of us have a fear. I just I said spiders, you know, and you know what? Guess what? What's the number one spider? None of us. If you're afraid of spiders, the number one spider you don't want to see in an alley is a tarantula right? You know, tarantulas, they're hairy, they're big, whatever. Well, guess what? I went to Big Bend National Park um, earlier this year for the first time. It's a park. It's a, it's a beautiful dark sky park. So a park I've been dying to go to. However, all of my coworkers were like, Gabe, just FYI, there's a lot of tarantulas there. And I'm like, and scorpions. I'm like, you know what? I'm less afraid of the scorpions. I don't know why. Maybe they don't have hair on them. Maybe they don't have eight eyes. They're definitely more dangerous you know, the tarantulas, to be honest. Um, and I, you know, with trepidation each night, I was out there with my good friend, Joe, and he was so funny. He had no fear of these and he had a UV light and was shining lights and looking for scorpions all night. He'd be like, oh, found one, found one, took a picture, should bring it over, show it to me. We didn't see many, many, um, many tarantulas until one night we did as we were kind of going down a trail and I was frozen a little bit, you know, we, he was, that, that spider was in the middle of that trail and I really gingerly had to go past that. But you know what I did is I took out my phone and I recorded this spider because I said, I need to see this and I need to recollect this and I need to overcome this fear because, you know, this isn't, this doesn't have to be, you know, and, and maybe if I understand it more, and if I understand that these creatures are just as scared of me as I am of them, if not more so, you know, then that'll help me um, do it. And, and, and so I and so I did. And, and you know what? I was able to walk past that and walk more confidently down that path. Yes, I was shining a light and looking for more. But that now I was looking a little bit more curiously than anxiously because I was shifting the fear to understanding. OK. And, and, that, and that's a key thing. We can't, you know, we don't, can't live with it inside of us, right? We have to invite it. In order, in order to overcome anything, we have to overcome, we have to, we have to see it. We have got to climb it. You know, we, we can't hide from it. You know, the only way we can overcome something is by to invite it into your life. And whether that is reading books about it, whether that's going out, you know, I have friends that have gone into shark tanks. I also would not go into shark tank. I don't, I saw Jaws at a very early age um, and was afraid of swimming pools so much. You know, that's how much Jaws affected me. And again, irrational for that, you know, but we've got to overcome it. And, and one more, you know, again, I'm going to, boy, I'm going to share a lot of my fears here, but one of my other fears was fear of heights. And this is a totally normal fear. And I was in fear, I, I was a theater major in college. And part of being a theater major, you have to be a tech. You have to, you have to, and, and I really enjoyed being a tech. But when you were a tech, that meant you had to get on a very tall ladder. One of those ladders that was like, you know, a triangle. And then the middle part would go up another 20 feet. I had to overcome that. And that was a really, you know, again, I had to invite it into my life. I had to go up those stairs. I had to hold on and make sure I wasn't. <laughs> losing blood in my hands, but I had to go up there and I had to adjust lights on the stage. And I had to straddle that, <laughs> you know, and I, but I wanted to do it. I didn't want to be paralyzed by fear. And as you can see, this is an old photograph. Um, not, not many people have seen this. This is an old photograph um, from Maine Media. I was up at Maine Media Workshops and I was photographing with a friend of mine, Lance, and, and a workshop up there. And definitely the night is mysterious, it's dark, it's got a lot of shadows, and it's normal concept, you know, people preconceived notion of, of night and fear, night equals fear, right? Because it's dark, mysterious, and all this. And so I took this picture because 
I like the shadows. And I said, let me, don't take, you know, take a picture of me, but make sure it's just the silhouette of me. We want to just see that kind of looming shadow come forth. And yeah, when you look at this picture, you, this it's a menacing picture, I hope a little bit. That's kind of that emotion that I was trying to evoke with it. Um, maybe I shouldn't have a fedora on, maybe it should be a cowboy hat or something like that. But, um, but again, fear is natural. And the more that we try to understand our personal fears, hopefully the better we can overcome it by understanding by, that you gain knowledge by knowledge, you gain kind of, again, that more of that understanding as in the turn shifts over uh, from fear to from that. So, so let's talk about a lot of some of the fears that you might encounter at night. You know, now we're national parks at night. So we do a lot of workshops in the wilderness. And what are we afraid of? Uh, because, you know, it's so beautiful to be under the stars, to be away from it all. We're at parks that see thousands of people during the, uh, during the day. You know, there's, the only fear you have is like of other people like bumping into you or whatever, knocking you over, maybe stealing something or, you know, God forbid, something like that. But really, it's serene, it's quiet, it's beautiful, but almost in that stillness, there can be a fear, you know, and I've spoken to many people that are afraid of that quietness or of what else is out there, what other critters are out there. And this was a photograph I took. This is along the Blue Ridge Parkway. And when I was photographing this, I was photographing alone. Not something I like to do, but sometimes it just happens that way. And I, when I go out to photograph at night, I like to spend at least three hours. You know, to me, I'm not get, it takes me an hour to get warmed up, you know, uh, and then I like to shoot for three to four hours beyond that. So a good shoot for me is three to five hours. So it's probably about really an hour into this. And I was light painting this fence. And all of a sudden I heard this sound and it was, I, I, it must have been coyotes. Um, I've some, that's something you frequently hear out in the wilderness, no matter where you are when, on the West coast, the East coast, you know, coyotes, but these coyotes were a bit more guttural <laughs> than the ones I'm used to a yowl. I can, I can, I can, I can handle because a yowl, or a bark sounds like a dog. I love dogs, so I can kind of get over there. But this was like, this was guttural. This was something really strange about this one. And I just started shooting here. I didn't want to leave. So I used a tip that one of my students taught me. Uh, Sandra Youngling, if you're here, she was the first person I bumped into during a workshop. And she would be shooting and she would have a portable speaker. Uh, hanging on her tripod, hanging on her backpack, and she would play music. Now, to be honest, Sandra, I kind of thought that was a little annoying at first because I thought, hey, here we are in the wilderness. I love listening to just the crickets, the nothingness, the whatever of, of the, that the night brings. And also, I, love to be, I always like to be aware of my surroundings, you know. Um, but there she was. She was playing the music, and, and, and we kind of talked about it. We discussed it, and it gave, it gave her comfort. And I thought, you know, I love music and mu and other animals when we're out there, they don't really want to be bothered with us unless we're slathered with like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or something like that. You know, they really, they don't want to interfere with us. Um, and you really don't want to interfere with them at night. So by playing music, by making noise, like a lot of times when we walk on a path or do something like that, we like to have conversations. And when we have conversations at night, maybe there are a few more octaves higher than you would normally do it just to kind of let that wilderness world know that you're out there. So I played music and I didn't blast it, but I probably put it at volume five. And those guttural sounds stopped. They were like, okay, someone else is over there. And maybe they were even saying, what the heck is that? I haven't heard that, you know. Um, I can't, maybe I was playing some rave music or something like that. I don't know what it was, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, it, that it stopped. I gained more comfort and I just clipped that speaker. This is the one I got right here. It's just a little JBL and it has a little carabiner clip on it. And I just clipped it, you know, clipped that to my backpack 
and I bring it with me now on all of my photo shoots. Sometimes I, I, I don't use it unless I hear something else. Because again, I like to, just like I don't like wearing headphones on subways, I want to be aware of my surroundings. And that is also very important to gaining comfort is being aware of your surroundings. However, bringing that music, bringing a little noise to the scene is not a bad thing. and just lets the world around you be aware that you're there and you're sharing their space. But you know what? Listen, I'm an urban guy uh, and I do a lot of photography in cities. And that's a big fear on everyone's, especially if it's not their own city, you know, and it takes people years to get comfortable with their own city. And, you know, is it these dark alleyways? Is it the general chaos or, or what, you know, but I've, I love shooting in cities and my main tip is obviously shooting. Don't shoot alone, shoot with friends, shoot with friends and shoot with confidence. You know, again, confidence takes time, but if you, you know, I don't have my gear, you know, I have my gear out when I'm a, during a setup, but when in a, an urban location, and I'm going to go from location A to location B, I'm going to pack up my camera. I'm going to put it in my bag. I'm going to shorten my tripod. Tripod, And I don't know about you, but I feel kind of confident and secure with a tripod. You know, I'm not a fighter <laughs> out there, but having a tripod is does give me that extra confidence that I could defend myself if I if need be. I've never had to. In over 20 years of photographing at night in urban locations, I've never had to defend myself. Have I bumped into homeless people? Yes. Have I bumped into security officers? Yes. You know, I bumped into lots of people. I've had discussions with lots of people, um, but very rarely have they have they gone sour. And, and so my wife was the first one to tell me, you know, hey, I, I don't mind you shooting, but you, I want you to shoot alone. I, don't, I want you to shoot with, with friends, with somebody. It just makes, makes me feel better. And I was like, you know, when she told me that, I was probably in my early 30s and I was like, bah, well, okay, all right, I'll do it for you. But I mean, I feel fine. But you know what? It was like the best thing she ever told me because out of that, um, I, yes, I have encountered situations similar to coyotes, but that have just kind of, again, more of that quietness of a city um, or the darkness that you might feel uncomfortable with. And I've been happy to have a friend with me uh, there. And if I wander a little further away, just seeing them over there, just helps me feel a bit more confident or perhaps we shoot together. And I, I feel obviously, you know, bad things can, can happen. But if you hold yourself with confidence, if you walk with confidence and your gear is not out there, that people won't bother you, you know, at least in that negative way. I firmly believe that put out positivity, you'll get positivity. If you put out negativity, if you're, you know, if you're walking around hunched like this, then people will take advantage of that. So really key thing for urban, you know, night photography, and this is just one of the tips, we'll get to a few more of that, but it's shooting with friends and seizing the, and how, and seizing those nights, because it's, the cities are, are beautiful, wonderful places to explore long exposures. And like I said at the, at the beginning, fear is combated by knowledge. Believe in yourself, hold yourself up, right? This and, and and differentiate obviously the rational from the irrational fear. You know, there are totally rational fears, like you know, is is you know, there's a person right over there. Is that person going to come over and talk to me or, or bring bad vibes or whatever? Or is there irrational fears that this building's going to fall over, or the spiders are going to crawl over me, or all these other kind of things. So differentiate that, you know, and, and try to dismiss those irrational ones, right? And, 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 and also overcome those rational ones. Knowledge is the key to both. And whether you study about those fears, those spiders, and figure out that, yeah, you know what, they don't really normally attack humans, <laughs> less provoked, many people have pets, et cetera, et cetera, you know, but knowledge, knowledge is definitely key. And this, this is a photograph. This is one of my favorite photographs from a while back. 
Um, and this is my, bu my buddy Tom. We're photographing together out in North Park. This is in Pittsburgh. I don't know if you can see it, but that little, uh, the doorway, right above the doorway, there's that emblem and it says the Fountain of Youth. And we drove by that. I'm like, oh my, I got to shoot the Fountain of Youth. I've been looking for this my whole life. Um, and so I, I immediately pre-visualized an image like this, the discovery, right? So how, who, we've all been searching for that magical serum that's gonna hold back time, right? And so I knew, I, I knew that I wanted Tom to play this explorer coming across this like, look at this place, it's like a tomb, right? Um, in, built into a hill, but beautiful. And, over, and I think it's like 100 years old or 80 years old. So, and I love see, getting this, I love this, the flashlight, the silhouette of him. And I set up some light painting with coast flashlights along the side. So his light is that kind of blue turning orange light that's kind of right on the middle. And it's also that light is giving him a silhouette. And I wanted to keep him a silhouette, keep that mystery there. But I also used another uh, flashlight. And I think I went to both sides and kind of scraped like a 90 degree angle along the um, along this this crypt, this the, the Fountain of Youth bricks and stuff to bring detail and information to that. When we first <laughs> tested this shot, Tom shot, you know, stood where he was. I kind of said, okay, stand right there. Okay, put on the flashlight. Let's see how that looks. As soon as that flashlight went on, a bat flew out of that, um, out of that entrance and right above his head. And to him, I mean, he's, he, Tom, I, I apologize if you're, if you're here, but you squealed. He squealed. It seemed like a thousand bats came out of there. But I mean, maybe there was three. I, I only re really remember one. Um, and, and that's sort of a, you know, again, sort of an unknown thing that happened. It was a rational fear, you know, because it obviously based in reality there that happened and gave him the jitters. Uh, but we then, what, we, what did we do then was we actually walked, I said, let's, well, let's go see what's actually in here before we, you know, is there like, is this the bat cave or what, you know? Um, and we walked in and took a look around and it's a very small room. There was no well or anything like that. And we did not see any more bats in there. So we, but we went together. You know, we went, we stepped there together to kind of see, okay, the fear came out of here, that bat. What else is in there so that we can be, you know, either not harm it, obviously, or just, you know, make sure this isn't going to happen again. And, and no one wants anything flying right, <laughs> right over them, you know. And, and so we, we spent a moment in there, kind of just breathing it in and gaining knowledge of this place. And by gaining knowledge, we gained confidence. And we, we stuck it out at this location for an hour, you know, to kind of really get this photograph done. Another way we can overcome, you know, gain more confidence is by photographing places that we're familiar with. This is in my neighborhood. This is the bridge, uh, the summit bridge that connects uh, my neighborhood, uh, Carroll Gardens in Brooklyn to Red Hook, goes over the BQE. It's a very loud um, place to be. And when I shot here, this is a shot on film. When I shot here, I probably spent 30 minutes, 45 minutes, you know, working on that shot. And that's kind of always right. That's, this is a risk. This is a concern is that when we are doing night photography, often we aren't moving one place to the location quickly, like a ninja, <laughs> you know, we hope to be like a ninja, but a very slow ninja. <laughs> you know, and because usually it takes 30 minutes, 40 minutes to, you know, get, get your shot. So I was kind of, I could have been a prime suspect, but I don't know. I, whether I, I was very comfortable because this was my neighborhood, several people walked by mainly neighbors or, and others people, not, not neighbors that I, I've never met before. Uh, you know, no one actually talked to me and asked me what I was doing. I think it was pretty obvious, but uh, you know, definitely good conversations can come of it. Um, but definitely photographing that, you know, if, if you are uncomfortable and I also shot this alone and if you need to shoot alone, photograph places that you're comfortable with, photograph your neighborhood and maybe stay, you know, start your shooting 
at sunset or a little before and then stay past it. And, you know, maybe you can only get an hour past sunset, you know, alone. Maybe you can get two hours, maybe get three hours. You know, try to extend it each time. It take because it does take time to build that confidence. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, so, you know, but but starting in your neighborhood, starting during the daytime, sunsets are always, always nice. You know, who doesn't like a good sunset? But then stay through the twilight and maybe stay till it gets dark and see how those same sort of locations change and evolve. And before you know it, you'll be out probably for three hours. Now, obviously, even a little bit closer to home, for those of you who have, you know, a backyard or property, you know, shoot on your own property. That is easy, right? This is on my in-laws have a meadow. Um, out, you know, they've got a meadow out, you know, two hours southeast of Pittsburgh. And I love, I kind of love playing on this meadow. There was a creek nearby. And this meadow, I spent plenty of evenings because this is the only thing really I could shoot that I was familiar with when I would go to visit them. And I love, and I, and I kind of challenged myself. And this taught me how to deal with lighting, with sodium vapor lighting, which we see over there. Uh, you know, and I did star trails, I did star points, I did all sorts of things. I would often test ideas and concepts in my own backyard, right? The more we test these concepts and ideas sort of in the comfort of either our own home or in our backyard or in our neighborhood, the better we will be, again, more knowledge we'll have, and the better we'll be with those concepts and more confidence we'll have out in the field. So bottom line, right? Don't shoot alone. That's why we love our workshops. Um, this is one of, from one of a shot I, I, I hold dear. This is one of, from one of our earliest photo shoots. And, and then we're in Zion National Park. And obviously what, what the, the, the beauty of Zion is the other one, right? When everyone's photographing. But I loved sort of the, um, the comfort I felt and the people I was with. And this made us feel, just all of us feel so, um, again, comfortable at night. And that brings me to kind of really embracing the three C's um, of, th that can help build confidence, which is the fourth C, right? But we have, there's three C's to help you build that. One of them is comfort and finding comfort. So we've talked about finding comfort by, you know, shooting in your neighborhood, shooting, you know, it, you know, even shooting inside. Shooting with others, you know, don't shoot alone. There's comfort there that we can find um, that will make us more confident. The other C that comes from comfort and comes from not shooting alone is the camaraderie, right? I love doing these group shots on our workshops. This is sort of a mandatory thing that we do at every workshop. So those of you can guess, this is from Joshua Tree National Park. And this was from this was from the first workshop I did in a year and a half. This is the, you know, I the whole um, you know, pandemic. I was for the most part in Brooklyn and inside. I had come back from a trip to Norway, considered heavily staying in Norway, <laughs> you know, instead of coming back, but I had a wife and a cat and family and friends to come back to. Uh, but I didn't do a workshop. I didn't see the stars for over a year during the pandemic. This workshop at Joshua Tree was the first workshop that brought me back out under the stars. And for so many of the other students here, it was their first workshop. Now where they, some had lived, you know, kind of near stars and darker locations and stuff like that. But coming together. This was a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we really bonded very tightly with this group because we were experiencing something all together. And that camaraderie just helps build confidence. And whether you are just again, shooting together, maybe doing light painting together, bouncing ideas off each other, or just, you know, chit-chatting and stuff like that, that camaraderie just helps build confidence and, and helps the time go by you know, during long exposures that we may, might normally be, again, stuck in our head. So 
I love this photograph. And then uh, my, my the next workshop I did after this, totally opposite, we got a Milky Way group shot. And this was a great one because this was an adventure workshop. This was the Shenandoah workshop, which you've seen a couple of pictures of from before. We went to Harpers Ferry. We went to Luray Caverns. We went to Shenandoah. And, um, and, and it was a wonderful like road trip adventure. And that also built so much camaraderie amongst us because, again, we were all experiencing that together. And night photography, I think, is more unique than any other type of photography because people want to do it together, right? People want to go out, shoot together, bounce ideas, or kind of work like how, you know, how cinematographers work. You know, it's funny. I have a lot of cinematographer friends and they need to be a group of five people. You need your audio person. You need your, your, uh, your director. You need your, 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 uh, your director of the, uh, of the filming, you know, and you, and they need other helpers as well. So it's so funny. Photography, photography can be such a solo sport, whereas cinematography is a group effort. But photographers, we don't have to be alone. We really don't. Now, street photography, I don't know. We'll talk to Derek about that. Street photography might be a little bit tricky, you know, but maybe everyone owns a corner <laughs> and, then, and then comes back to the, you know, meets up and shares and stuff like that. But sharing, you know, I've been doing photography for over 20 years and sharing in, in the world of photography is at an all time high. And that helps just build that camaraderie, the friendships, and, um, and I think helps just level up everyone's images just because we're sharing more than we have ever done so before. And also with that third C, so comfort, camaraderie, and collaboration, right? And this is the key thing. And yes, we can shoot with our friends. And yes, they could just be there for comfort or for bouncing ideas off of each other. But, but if you're like-minded, and you most likely are if you're doing night photography, collaborate together. This is a shot. This is a group effort shot um, from uh, one of our Joshua Tree workshops where we had, I think, five to seven people each doing light painting throughout the scene. Only one person took the photograph. Because in order to get this panorama, you needed to be a very specific spot, right? It would the light painting would change one foot to the left, one foot to the right. But if we, if so, we the 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 group as a whole decided to have one person to take the photograph and then share that image afterwards, and everyone could post process it to their own liking, and then everyone else got involved, and we felt like we're on a movie set. Right. Everyone else got involved and was doing light painting from light painting that windmill in the background, the the uh, the rocks, the you know, the water tower. Again, like I said, there was like seven or eight lights kind of going on here and it couldn't have been done without collaboration. And light painting is so key. It's so difficult to do on your own because oftentimes we're light painting not from behind the camera because that's the flattest, most boring type of light. We want to light paint to the side. If we're light painting from the side, it's going to look different than the angle of the camera. So it's really, really important. And you'll to have a partner in crime to collaborate with, or partner in light painting, sorry, partner in light painting to collaborate with. And one person plays the director and does the photography and you can have both cameras, I guess, sandwiched side by side if you want, or again, you share the images, but having one director and one light painter, and you should take turns, you know, because not, you know, it, that that's how we build, uh, you know, our light painting skills. And light painting skills, just like lighting skills, are often the hardest things to craft at the end. So again, collaboration is key. Now, not just collaborating you could not just you can collaborate with other photographers, right? But also um, models, right? So this is we're back at Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, and this is my new friend Catherine, who is um, dressed in this old, you know, sort of Sleepy Hollow wear. Right, uh, the headless horseman must be right around the corner here, but we had this awesome discussion. We were introduced to each other. I, you know, I was working with Sleepy Hollow. I wanted to do this, this shoot there. And, and they introduced us and we, we kind of discussed some ideas. I wanted to create ghosts 
and do this creative. So she was all on board. She, luckily, she's a model that does photography as well. So the, the discussions were quite easy. Um, but here is, you know, I was the director. And in this image, I'm using a flash, a pro photo, A1 flash. And I'm, I'm telling her, okay, you know, this exposure was probably 30 seconds, maybe a minute long. And I'm, we kind of marked the spots for her to stand. And we talked about and collaborated about how to interact. I don't want, you know, the story here is not just there's three of the same person here. The story is how they're interacting. You know, we did several different poses and tried several different things. She showed me what was sort of in her wheelhouse and we kind of bounced ideas. And it was a wonderful collaboration. And that's anytime you're working with a model, day or night, it's a collaboration. They've got to give, you've got to give, and you got to hopefully find that synergy that there that 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 model understands exactly what is in your in your mind and that makes it easy for you to take that image now we've also going going back to comfort we've talked about comfort of your you know your surroundings but also there's some there's comfort in your gear you got to know your gear and this is something we always tell you know our our students going out in a workshop is uh you know i don't recommend bringing brand spanking new gear on a workshop. At least get it two weeks ahead of time, or even if you're renting gear, get it a week ahead of time and get to know your gear. If you're fumbling around with your gear, you're not confident and you're not going to be successful in your photography. And you could be opening yourself up to other things out there that could take advantage of your. Um, of your fumbling, of your, of your, of your, you know, your not confidence out there and, you know, shining a light on your gear, looking with the buttons and stuff, the more you're, you know, you understand your gear, the more you play with your gear, just though, just also the more productive you're going to be in the field. And that is just a key thing. And this is one of my favorite shots I took again during the pandemic when I was stuck inside and, and I was kind of, Hey, I've got all these cool tools how can I play with them and still kind of keep my creative edge here? Um, so here I am using a, again, I think this is the Pro Photo A1, various different locations. Note that I am wearing a different hat at each pose. Um, but that, that also led, oh, let's the other button here. That also led for me to, um, again, practicing with the lights out to help gain comfort and confidence. And this is a photograph I took of my doorway inside my house. I mean, probably the most boring subject you can pick. However, that light is all created with a flashlight and my hand. I basically turned on a flashlight and kind of held it through sort of my hand and let the light kind of come through my fingers to create this like light coming through the blinds, that noir feel, right? And I, I experimented with plenty of things and I stood up on the chair and get the angle coming down. I really liked the, and why, you know, why was I attracted to this at the beginning is because I noticed as I was walking around my house with the lights out, that the light, you know, that's a metal door by the way too. And, and the light coming th from the outside through the peephole and from the edges kind of comes in at night. It's sort of our own automatic, nightlight i guess and i was like hmm that got me thinking and and the, the, you know this wall the, this door this wall has texture to it so i wanted to kind of bring that out um so again practice and this is again when you get new gear practice with your gear practice inside we can easily do night photography in the comfort of our own home you know before testing those concepts we talked about earlier and trying out our new gear do it inside Turn out the lights, have fun. You never know what'll happen. Light painting is an easy thing for us to practice indoors. And communication. Uh, this is a <laughs> not so fun experience um, right here. That, and the shot is whatever, you know, uh, we are in uh, Capitol Reef. And um, this is, I think the temple of the, uh, of the, of the sun and the moon. And we had a permit to be here overnight with a group. 
And so we were setting up um, some light painting, which were basically two Luxly LED lights that were set to kind of see the, the, the soft sort of lighting that you'll see on it. When we got there, there was another photographer there, a professional photographer. And he was very upset that we were going to be there that night. And I said, you know, uh, it's a, our national parks are for everyone. You know, I actually have a permit to be here. You know, do you? You know, if you're doing professional work, you do need to have a permit to be there. Um, he did not answer that, but said, you know, um, that he just didn't want us to mess up his shot. He was basically in his head and just upset that anyone else was there. And it was a very negative energy that he was putting out. And, and Matt and I, who were there with our group, we just tried to, hey, listen, let's just communicate. We could all do this. We've done this before, you know, where we communicate. And if you don't want light painting, we could turn it off, but we should take turns, you know, and, and see what happens, you know, and, let, and let's just communicate <laughs> is the bottom line is, is let's just communicate and make sure that you know, we're not stepping on anyone's toes and that everyone's getting the shot that they want. He really didn't want to communicate. He, he really didn't, you know, and he would basically stand 50 feet away from us and yell at us, berate us, and, and then finally just walked away. And this is him, you know, so with his red light on in front of all of our shots so if essentially ruining everyone's shots like we were ruining his he decided to ruin everyone's shot and it's you know it's lame um but i actually in the end i actually kind of did like the shot you know and, and it reminds me about how the importance of communication and that again sometimes we're going to meet people that aren't going to be communicate communicative you know and and, and and again, try, we were really trying with a lot of positive energy to make this happen. And guess what? We bumped into him one more night. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, just do your best to, to put that best foot forward, forward, foot forward. And, and oftentimes it can end up being a collaboration of sorts. Like for instance, you know, the most popular spot in the world of night photography is probably uh, just one um, delicate arch in uh, arches. Uh, national park but then this arch rock here in joshua tree this is one that if you go there on a new moon uh you'll guarantee to find about 10 to 15 people standing up um along this area where you can stand up to climb up to and take this photograph because the milky way rises right above the rocks i've shot here about three or four times with a lot of people and a, a lot of people more than our workshop group and we've had to communicate and we've had to set up light painting and we've had to turn off light painting. I mean, the really cool thing about these Luxly lights, this is a Luxly fiddle. I love using this. And this was being used in this shot is that you can remotely turn it on and off. So I don't have to clamber down. And if you have it kind of positioned in a spot, you can easily get to it and, you know, say, okay, we can take a shot with it off. Now we can, for those of you who want it on. And we, we would basically let everyone in the row get their, their vision accomplished. It was like, okay, what do you want to get done? Okay, I want to do a, you know, and as long as it wasn't like an hour exposure, obviously, you know, if you're going to do an hour exposure or time lapse, I'm sorry, you're going to, a time lapse, you're going to show everyone's thing. But most of the time we're getting star point photography for this kind of shot. And so everyone kind of had like a five minute thing where they could try out two or three shots. The rest of us, we'd, we'd all communicate one, two, three, you know, open. Uh, you know, and, and everyone would have a turn and we all learned from each other and we all learned a little bit more about light painting or, or all learned about like stacking or other kind of things like that. So just to show you that kind of what it looks like, here's sort of, here's the setup. And I'm just, I'm actually in the middle. I'm halfway. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven people there. And these are shot with a, uh, I think this is a 12 millimeter lens. This is Sony's 12 millimeter lens. So this is obviously super wide. A lens, but you could see how tight people are to set this up, and every one of those people got their turn to get their shot because we communicated, right? So it can be done. Sometimes we come in hot, <laughs> but I think by kind of not being defensive and just being explaining what you're doing, then 
you can communicate and, and collaborate and gain comfort and maybe some new ideas. Let's talk a little bit about the light team. Um, and, and again, I, I, I've mentioned how collaborative that can be. I do a lot of light painting alone just because that, again, I'm shooting alone. And this is at a recent uh, shot uh, in, uh, this is Sandy Hook. This is uh, one of, uh, uh, one of that the barracks, why am I spacing on the name? Uh, but basically uh, one of the, um, I don't know why I'm spacing, but one of the cement structures from over you know, 100 years ago. And this one, I really kind of love this one. I saw it, scouted it during the day and, and had a bunch of ideas here. And in order for me to do the lighting here, which is done with two things. One is I have a flashlight and one of these coast flashlights. This was the HP7. And that's the light that you're seeing come out of the tunnel. And that light is also kind of really nicely scraping the ground and really en enhancing the railroad tracks that we see there. Now, there's also lighting coming from the side, and that is done with the Luxley fiddle that you can see right here. And this Luxley fiddle was probably at, I think this was actually at like two or three percent. We often photograph this at 0.1 percent at, you know, in really dark locations, but this has got obviously Sandy Hook uh, has a lot of um, urban light coming from the city, coming from the highlands and stuff like that. So I think I had to pump this up to four or five percent to get that more light on the, um, on the structure there. Here's the picture, my test shot of it prior to the lighting. Because um, again, the lighting helps you see and create in the dark, right? So here's the, here's the picture. <laughs> so you can see without any lighting, this shot would be nigh impossible, <laughs> right? That's That's the sky exposed correctly. Um, and yeah, sure, I guess I could take a shot of the interior, you know, of the structure and then of the sky. They're going to be two different and blend them together. Uh, but I, again, love to do lighting and and this helps me see. And this took me three or four tries. Again, I probably been, may, might have been quicker if I had someone there with me, uh, but I was able to get this. So this shot, again, flashlight inside, Luxley outside. Then I reversed it and I did... Hold on, I did this shot. So with this one, again, the Luxley is inside and, and that way I could kind of, I had that on. And I think this one was on like at like 20 or 30% because I wanted that sort of mystery of what's coming from inside to be brighter than the um, structure outside. So I used the flashlight, I used that Coast flashlight to kind of just brush the exterior, open that up with uh, enough information, but I really wanted our emphasis in our eyes to go into the, um, into, in, inside the tunnel. Now I will say, you know, while I was doing this, this is a, kind of like a, a spooky place, right? <laughs> you know, uh, definitely enhanced by the black and white processing. I was really glad to have this Lexley light on and shining a light, <laughs> you know, just shining a light, like a night light for me to, the, to help me a see, to help me compose, and perhaps to help me feel just a little bit at night. And, you know, again, I had a permit here. I was kind of, I had the place to myself, except for, you know, anyone that was kind of camping or staying there overnight. So I didn't feel fear of that, but you know, whatever, just the irrational stuff sometimes kind of creeps in and, uh, Sometimes lighting or a light on, whether it's sort of a little lantern that you kind of just have by you, a flashlight, you know, or whatever, that kind of helps, you know, shine a little light on the darkness and helps you feel a little bit, a little safer. Researching and scouting. Also, this helps you build confidence. This helps you um, feel more comfortable with the surroundings. Um, I had researched, this is also um, Sandy Hook and overlooking the uh, New York City skyline right there. I had researched this location. Here's the, uh, here's the shot that I took during the daytime, quite similar. And I had seen these lights that were on, or that they weren't on, but I saw that, hey, you know, there really wasn't many lights around, but there was some in lights that you could see sort of at the bottom of uh, 
of, of the uh, cement structure there. And so I kind of worked on my uh, my composition and everything. And I had that, I often do these on my phone. Sometimes I do them on the camera, but then when I get to this location, cause this was maybe my third stop that night. And I try to scout everything during the day so that I can have my shots and I put them in my notes in, um, in my notes program. And I have the pictures there and I said, okay, Gabe, these are the shots you need, you, you want to do tonight. And, and that helps keep me productive, efficient, comfortable and then and then confident because i can I walk in into the scene i said i know what i'm getting now i'm always open to seeing how the night lights play and how that composition plays out like the this light came on i was kind of struggling actually with this shot um because that light wasn't on that like that only that light only came on for about like 20 minutes it's like they saw that i was there and said oh hey let's let's give beaterman a little light there um so i thought that was really funny um, and that light came on and I said, oh, boom. And I added some little complimentary light to it to add to it as well. Freeing yourself from the funk, you know, and start doing, you know, that oftentimes the funk is an internal thing, right? That we just kind of, maybe we haven't taken a, done any photography in a little while. Maybe we haven't taken a good shot in a little while. But we just like like Matt had said in his presentation, you have to just get out there and start doing, you know, and shoot every night. That's a great way to get out of a photography funk, you know, and, and it kind of, you know, yes, you're going to, again, like I said before, have successes, but also have failures. But at least you're, you're in the zone. You're getting out there and experimenting. Um, and then try different techniques. This is something I, I, I've shown a lot of zooming techniques where we zoom into um, cityscapes and stuff like this. But this was um, shot in Dumbo area. And I tried instead of zooming, I kind of just went, boop, boop. I moved, or I actually would move down. I would just move the tri. We're, not, we're told not to move the camera while we're taking a long exposure. And it created this sort of very kind of surreal, interesting, uh, you know, cityscape, different, unique than anything I've taken. Uh, before and this kind of whether this is a great shot or not you know i like it and it's led to me experimenting other ways so that's a great thing that again even things that were like eh, maybe two stars maybe three stars they might lead down a path to other successes one of our workshops in san francisco one of our attendees brought one of these little globes with and i said wow that's kind of cool i always thought they were kind of kitschy but i could see it and then when i matched it with a lens baby so now I got two, I'm kind of trying two different techniques here. I got this with this beautiful bokeh, you know, soft, sharp, you know, skyline, uh, but playing with toys, you know, and again, play with them inside and then go out there uh, with them and maybe focus on a different tool, especially if you're, sh you're starting shooting frequently, starting shooting every night or shooting every once a week, something like that, bring a new tool out there to play with. Get out of your head right? And into the night. And this is something, a, a common, you know, these are, this is a people mover in Vegas that, you know, we were looking for things to shoot, uh, struggling a little bit. Then we said, wait a minute, you know, night photography, long exposures, movement. How is movement emphasized? Well, you know, put your camera on a tripod and do like a one or two second exposure and feel yourself going through the portal, right? So just getting out there um, and out of your head and get out there and doing it. Revisit your victories. You know, this is uh, Capitol Reef, back to Capitol Reef. This is one of my favorite shots that I took in, I think, 2017. A group collaborative shot with Matt and Chris, who drove the car and had the light painting uh, going on with this. And this is during a moon, you know, almost a full moon night. I, I love that location. I wanted to go back and under different conditions. And I got an even better shot, I think, facing the other way facing towards the Milky Way, the road to the Milky Way. So revisit locations, revisit those victories and see if there's some more, you know, lemonade that we can squeeze out of them. And just remember, it's, it's also, you know, one step at a time, right? Let's go back to knowledge. Knowledge is power, right? Knowledge is power, knowledge is comfort. And you, you control that on off switch for any negativity that surrounds you, right? So gain comfort with that knowledge 
and, and kind of try to get dispel that negativity. You know, fear just definitely takes courage, you know, to overcome that. But through that comes self-confidence. Find peers, find friends, you know, join a workshop um, and find that camaraderie, that comfort and build even more comfort and positivity by seizing the night. So I wanted that kind of ends. I think I'm ending a little late, uh, but again, wanted to share again, our, our information again, reminder, we are announcing our workshops in a few weeks, actually. Uh, alumni, you know about it. You'll be getting that announcement first. But if you're on your on our mailing list, sign up for that mailing list, and you will uh, be getting the second notification for our workshops. We're going to be going to, I think, over 20 locations next year. And again, if you want to gain comfort and have meet like-minded people and stuff like that, this is, National Parks at Night is a wonderful, wonderful place uh, to do it. So Scott, that about wraps me up. If there is any questions, I'll, I'm here. You're here. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a talk. Well, first off, thanks, Gabe. That, that, was, that was a lot of information and absolutely wonderful. Uh, I definitely can relate. You know, you're talking in the beginning about coyotes. And, and you reminded <laughs> me of when I went out to the West Coast, I went to go visit over there and I went for a little, a little jog. And, you know, like I said, I'm a city guy. I'm used to rats and pigeons and yeah, I'm okay right, with those guys yeah, because, exactly. because they're, they, they keep to themselves. But seeing a coyote for the first time was definitely a little bit alarming, even in kind of the, you know, sunrise phase of things where there was light, but it was just me and this one coyote and he looked really, really hungry. Oh, <laughs> yeah. and, and I said, you know what? I said, you have yourself a wonderful day, Mr. Coyote. I hope you find something that feeds your hunger. And I ran off in the complete opposite direction. Yeah. <laughs> so we do have some questions pouring in. Uh, let's start off with, uh, I don't want to butcher your name, but I do apologize if I do. Uh, Jakai asked, can you recommend a GPS device that would yeah. be easy to use to help on hiking? Because yeah. obviously at night, you know, it's a little difficult to yep. use markers. Totally. Uh, you know what? I actually use um, this app called All Trails. Um, or actually, you know, Gaia. I, I was turned on to All Trails, but then I like Gaia better. And Gaia uses your phone's GPS and tracks your the, tra the trail you're in. Now, if you're going into some serious wilderness and stuff like that, then I would get one of the Garmin's. I, I, I don't know the models off the top of my head, but they're usually 200 to $300 for these high-end Garmin's. There's Garmin's that also you can uh, make a SOS call from. And, and if, especially I know if you're going to be hiking in the winter, in the wilderness and by yourself, not with anyone, then yes, definitely ha get one that can get onto a sat phone or, or get onto some sort of SOS. Some of them have direct links to, you know, 911 and stuff like that. So highly recommend uh, doing that. Also, uh, you know, tell your, you know, even if you can't get friends to come out with you, tell them where you're going and check in with them, check in with them at the beginning of the shoot and say, Hey, I got home safe. You know, that's, that's, that's another great support system, you know, that we just don't even think about. That's always there. Right. Definitely. I think it's a great thing. I, I tell my, I tell my 14 year old son all the time, Hey, call me. It yes. doesn't matter where you are. Call yeah. me, yeah. get out of school. Call me, just give me a call. Let me know, you know, you're doing all right. <laughs> Yeah. Good, good piece of sagely advice that I think we forget as we get older. Right, right. We're, we um, remember when we were a 14 year old and didn't want to hear that. Correct. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we just we just shove it in the back and, and kind of ignore it until, you know, it comes back up again. Yeah, exactly. So Jen wants to know, um, with the lens ball, did you Photoshop your hand out of it or did you have a different method of holding the ball for that shot? So that shot is flipped upside down. So I don't know if you saw it, it was in the holder that you get with it. And it was kind of put on like a garbage can or something like that. And I was very close. I just cropped that garbage can out of it or whatever chair, whatever was out of it. And I kind of set up around it. And then I, I knew I was going to flip it, right? You know, uh, post, because I kind of, it just naturally lent itself to that as well. 
So when I was composing, I kind of knew that. And I was just kind of trying to get the focus for that. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, this, and, and that's uh, the, the, the actually the attendee who brought that had the holder. So uh, I, I don't have one of those lens balls, but if you do get the holder, that's going to make it a lot easier to use. And I think it's a little bit more natural uh, than Photoshopping your hand. That seems a bit tedious because, you know, you're also going to get that hand or one of those fingers on the front. So that's going to that's that's too much Photoshop for me. <laughs> <laughs> Great, which, which leads into uh, Maravik's question, which was, what kind of light do you usually use, the one that you could turn off and yep. on remotely? Yep. That's this puppy right here. This is the Luxly Fiddle. Uh, I have the red version, but it normally comes in black. Uh, really cool LED. It usually runs about $200, so it's a little bit on the high end for LEDs. But what I'll say is it has a very, CRI, a very high CRI rating. Most important for light night photography, you can dial it down to 0.1% as well as up to 100%. I'm actually using the big brother of this, the, the Lexi Cello. That's my light that's lighting me right now. I have my window drape closed. That light is lighting me right now. So these are not only great for, obviously, for night photography and what we call low-level uh, light painting. And if you want to learn more about that, we have a whole class on Thursday with Lance and Chris that are really going to go over how the, what you can do with this. But this is my go-to tool for sure. Um, put it maybe on a light stand, put it on a tripod, because, you know, that helps give it the flexibility to not always be on the ground and low and monster light. But also 2800 Kelvin to 10,000 Kelvin, and you can dial in any color under the sun with it. So that's sort of the versatility and that you could remotely control it with the app. I can change the power, turn it on, turn it off, change the color temperature. It's an awesome, awesome go-to light. So I use that. And then I always have flashlights. I have three or four flashlights. I'm a, a coast fan. Um, but uh, having a couple of different flashlights, is like having different paint brushes for a painter. There you go. So small little shameless plug for an upcoming event that'll take place this week. Uh, yep. Thursday, if I remember correctly, right? Yep. Yep. Thursday. Yep. I don't know if it's at one or three o'clock, but, uh, but yeah, look, look for that. It's, uh, it's all about light painting and low level light painting. Perfect. And, and obviously you can get that at b &H, in case you didn't know, just, just in case <laughs> just you were say, wondering where to go, you know, <laughs> bhphoto.com. That's, that's us. Yep. Uh, so Nihar wanted to know, you know, and this is obviously a very true statement. So I, I agree here, Nihar. Uh, workshops are amazing, but are expensive. Is there any other way to find groups of like-minded people? 100%. Oh my, more, so easy to do now than ever. I mean, there's all these meetup groups. Right. There's uh, I and uh, my friend runs the New York City night photography meetup group and they do free gatherings, free get togethers. You know, it's just whoever's available. Like I want to shoot here. You, you can host something. So meetup groups are totally, you know, the way to find like minded people. Obviously, Facebook groups, you know, are another way, you know, you can kind of create your own or there's tons of night photography Facebook groups. But what I will say, you know, is workshops are expensive. Yes. Uh, I didn't take a workshop until I was 30 years old, I think, but they help because nothing, you know, to have that dedicated, you know, I don't know, you know, our workshops are usually five nights, six days, you know, they cost almost $2,000, but you're getting 40 plus hours of education of on, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, training with these people. So we, you know, I think if it's something that you're really uh, want to learn, there's plenty of stuff you can do online, but you need to do it. You need to do it on the field, right? There's plenty of, plenty of online stuff too, but doing it out there, gaining comfort, gaining confidence. And when you have peers as well as professionals in the field to give you that feedback, um, that I think is worth its weight in gold. There you go. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the value in it. Yeah. And, and like you, and like you alluded to over the course of the, you know, conversation, you're not out there by yourself. Then. Exactly. So you don't and, have to... and, and listen, sometimes we take workshops, you know, to go to locations. Sometimes they get you to really cool locations that you don't normally have access to. Um, and, and sometimes they're just, again, more about learning a specific skill. But again, if it's something that you have, it's a serious budget consideration, then really research it, reach out to the, uh, the instructors and find out exactly what you're going to learn, find out what skills and, 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 fi and find the perfect match. There's something for you out there, you know, and, and find, and, and we've got people, we've got over 400 alumni 
And we've got some alumni that take three to four workshops a year. We've got some workshops that take one workshop every three years because, you know, of various reasons, but obviously budget can definitely play a big part of it. Budget, time, all that kind of stuff like that. So awesome. Awesome. Well, let's wrap it up here. Okay. We've got one last question for yep. you. Angie wants to know, how did you get the exposure of the full circle of light rays from the lighthouse? That's all Photoshop. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, you know, the funny thing about that is that that was taken at Fire, Fire Island Lighthouse. And we did two nights of, uh, two nights of, of, of shooting there. The first night was going to be rainy, miserable, and dreary. And everyone who was on that first night was like, can we change the second night? It's going to be clear tomorrow. And I'm like, you guys are missing the point here because why were lighthouses built? <laughs> you know, lighthouses were built for bad weather. That's where you'll see the essence of a lighthouse. Now that is a rotating lighthouse. There's different types of lighthouses, um, but this is a rotating lighthouse. And how I got that shot is by basically, um, I, uh, there's two ways that you can do this one. One is by kind of waving like a black hat or a black card in front of it like this. Just take one long exposure. That way is, can be inconsistent. The better way to do it is to use like a remote trigger uh, or an interval setting inside your camera and say, you're going to take this fraction of a second. You know, this, th th those, those exposures are like, I think they would vary I experimented between like, you know, a quarter of a second to like one second on those to kind of depend on how wide you want that beam to be. And then you just repeat it. You hold either hold down the trigger or put the, uh, put the, inter, you know, put the intervalometer on. Or, or, or put the time lapse on, and then you just kind of set it, and then let it do its. You'll see it do its turn. Shut it off then, or let it do its other thing, and then you take them, and you you actually do use Photoshop at the end. You, but you, it's an easy thing to then take them uh, into Photoshop and blend them together uh, from that way. I believe if you look at our blog, we do have. Uh, if you look at our blog, National Parks at Night, and go to and search lighthouses. I do believe we have a couple blogs uh, talking about the, the nitty gritty uh, of it. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, Melissa commented and I agree with her, said not, not a question, but happy she tuned in. It's always great to learn from you and especially happy to hear that the workshops will be announced soon. Uh, I, I share the sentiment, Gabe, it's always, always great to spend an hour with you. You're a fun guy, you got a lot <laughs> of great information. Uh, so we always, we always love having you here on the virtual event space. Uh, to everybody else who's tuned in, don't forget that this is only day two and, yep. and really just the start of day two of Night Photography Week here at b &H Photo. So you got your buddy in the back over there jumping around. I like it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we got, we got one more event coming up at five o'clock. So make sure to tune in for that. And then we've got the rest of the week planned out as well. We've got a ton of great content related to night photography coming up. So Gabe, thanks for being here again. We appreciate it. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you everyone to, for, for attending. Theo says hello. Uh, he's not afraid of the dark. He's afraid more of the day and a bunch of other stuff. We'll get into that later. <laughs> there you go. Pleasure to have you, Gabe. For everybody tuning in, thanks so much for joining us. 